Well, the Louise Trotters Carvin woman is busy. We have more women in finance and aerospace than we have in fashion. Aerospace? Are you serious? All these women, to this day, even the very successful girls out there, need to do their own shit. We need some good vibes. We we definitely need some good vibes. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, that was a bit too strong. I'm very enthusiastic today. Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back to my huge channel, everybody. Today I welcome you to an episode of Women's Suppression for the Sake of Old Power. Actually, I could have included this topic into the a series of quiet luxury because the quiet and quiet luxury actually means staying quiet towards injustice as well. I'm not joking, but this is a different topic. We're not talking about this today. We're talking about women and also fashion and collections and why, why that's important right now. And I don't want to be the... No, actually, I am a feminist, but I don't want to make this a huge deal only justifying why women are relevant but I just think even historically and fashion wise it's pretty important to have like an overview of what is meant by all of this stuff yeah we just have five percent CEOs we just have five women designing in the big houses like what does that actually mean what's the fundament of this and is it changing we're gonna see that today just to make it real quick what a woman is is you might know that they have different chromosomes and uh, the chromosome that they have leads to the fact that they are physically and mentally also a bit different. Very careful with the word different because nowadays everything that is not an old white man is different in 2023. Okay, I'm just kidding. I know everybody watching my videos is very smart, very intellectual, super cute and beautiful. So I won't explain, of course, what women are. And we love men. We love this is pro men's and women's channel. We, we need each other. We need let's fight together. So I won't explain why women are okay to exist, coexist, because it's 2023. But then again, I realized that women's got voting rights in Switzerland in 1971, which would explain that justifying a certain phrase by just mentioning its date is not relevant because 2023 doesn't mean anything. So we still need to, to, to teach people what it actually is. As you might heard from the news lately, um, we are struggling a bit. Um, we are struggling a bit, not in terms of fashion. Fashion goes well, business goes well. Money comes in, money comes out, collections come out, publicity, media, everything works well. But we struggle in fashion with a different topic. We're talking creative directors. And when we say creative directors, we need to be very careful because as much as there's a school of believers that say a creative director needs to have like a 20 year span of experience to be able to give us a collection of excellence, there are others that say you can come from a nursing school, you can have been a doctor, uh, I don't know, a theater player, whatever. You can have, could have done whatever you want, but as long as you're creative and, and this in a good way, you can be a creative director. So first of all, we know that the term creative director is very wide. That's also why we see influencers, musicians, everything popping up because people love this very wide definition of creative director. We're not talking about creativity by itself actually today, but it's really interesting to try to understand what, what creativity is. So when we talk about creative directors and the fashion industry and the issue I just mentioned, we can have a quick look on women's having designed stuff in the century, uh, whatever. So there have been, of course, many female creative directors. Which most famous ones did we have? We have Madame Coco Chanel, we have Elsa Scaparelli, we have Carolina Herrera, we have Gisanda, we have Mucha Prada, we have Vivian Westwood, we have Sonia Riquel, we have Ray Kabakubo, we have Donna Karen. All these women are impeccably creative and introduced a new vision of artistic understanding into this world in a radical and sometimes subverse way. What do they all have in common? Um, yeah, they're almost pretty much dead. Um, very sad to say this, but this is just facts. Like they're pretty much dead, most of them, if not close to it. But except that there is another point about them, except for the age and what is happening six feet under. There's another thing that is, you say, hey, what, what's wrong, Tuba? You named so many influential designers. I'm sure we just have as many male uh, creative directors that are like this. What's the problem? 
Um, why are you so angry? Don't be an angry woman. Don't be so cliche. Just just chill. Like just chill. What what's wrong with them? Well, these women have been successful because they turned themselves into founders. They realized probably very early stage that they will not ever get a big position as a creative director in a big house. So turning yourself into an entrepreneur is of course the best way to start. Of course, it's always easier if you have had the experience in a bigger house before, but try to get in there. Like I'm sure in the 50s, it was more than impossible to go uh, to turn into a creative director in any house, mainly also because the founders of the, those houses were still alive, like Balenciaga or Dior or whoever, but also you just didn't get a job. You need to turn yourself into a founder, into an entrepreneur as a woman, so nobody can tell you what you're supposed to do. And of course, there's a new force of young creatives that have founded their own brand, like Grace and Wales Bonner, Marty Rose, Simon Rocha, the Olsons at the Row, we have June Ahn for Ambush. There are these names, yes, but also these women are all founders of their own namesake brand. They didn't get any position in a big house yet, even though there was a lot of sound around it that Martin Rose, for example, should have been acquired by Louis Vuitton or whatever. We tried. We really tried to get these women into big houses, but they didn't manage. And maybe some of them never wanted to. I'm sure the Olsen twins, first of all, they didn't have to have any education as creative directors, but they didn't need to. Nevertheless, at the very end, all these women to this day, even the very successful girls out there need to do their own shit. They need to build their own house because you don't get a job as a big creative director nowadays. So let's think of the creative di female creative directors that work for different houses, for external houses. We have some names. It's not that there are none. We have some remaining, some survivors that managed to get inside. Uh, we have Virginia Viard at, um, I was about to say at Karl Lagerfeld. No, <laughs> at Chanel. Um, she's also, she's also having this position because of Karl Lagerfeld, because he wanted her to keep on going. So again, a man needed to put his um, words for somebody, for a female, so she can. I'm pretty sure she would not have had the position. Of course, she was like uh, his right hand for centuries, but still not sure about this. Sarah Burton, first of all, she's not at Alexander McQueen anymore, but she also had the position because Alexander McQueen personally wanted her to stay at this brand. Not sure if she would have stayed. I think it was very much an emotional reason people didn't want her to leave because it was a bit like not fulfilling Alexander's will maybe. So she stayed pretty long time and we know that somebody else came from JW Anderson. Let's see how this is going to turn out, but a male person. And oh, I hate to say stuff like a female, a male, because I don't want to characterize or reduce people on their genitals or on their, on their species or whatever they are. It's horrible that this industry is forcing me to separate because it's only about talent. Nobody should give a shit if it's about being a woman or a man. Like, ah, oh, it's driving me honestly crazy. It's driving me crazy that we still have to talk about this topic. I mean, if you look at the news today, it's horrible what is going on and I want everything to end. And the only thing I can wish for is at least the change that we can do and the things we do have an influence on in this world, at least in the Western world, like, Come on, let's do it here, right? Like, we don't have to joke about any other countries right now, to be honest, that are less uh, evolved or anything because they don't protect human rights. Like, we're still not over it. We're just pretending, but we're still not over it. Uh, I'm sorry for my rage, but this needed to go. Yeah, but we need some good vibes. We, we definitely need some good vibes right now. So who else did we have? We had Claire White Keller at Givenchy, who did a great job. She's doing Uniqlo C now. I don't know if I'm already clear about my opinion. I've seen this stuff in stores. Not sure, but I can if you're interested in it because I know that some of you like my Uniqlo videos. I can order a big batch of Uniqlo U and C and check the quality and if, if price ratio is okay for being um, a fast fashion retailer who looks cuter because it's a Japanese brand. And so we think everything is fine. And we have, of course, the queen Maria Grazia at your, to be very honest, I'm turning into this person now, just for the sake of her being female, I'm like, you stay there. You know, the industry has turned me into the person, into the kind of person I hate very much the most. 
I just want somebody to stay somewhere because I hate the others. I will be like, I know you don't like her, so I want her to stay. She's gonna continue designing these Victorian um, 18th century dresses and these patterns that looks that look like they are Southern American curtains, uh, some French Revolution vibes as well on them, and like very, very bad shoes. I want her to continue with this. Like, that's what you deserve. And one, the only good news of the week, I guess, Chloe, uh, you might have heard of the new appointment for Chloe, uh, which has also been designed the last 10 years by male creative directors. But now we have Cemena Capali, uh, who has been working for the brand for centuries and ages. Uh, and knows the brand very much and uh, considers herself also as a Chloe woman. To be honest, I was not anti-Gabriella Hurst. I know she's very different. Uh, her aesthetic is also pretty... It's a bit a mix of cultural hobo bohem sophistication. I compare it a bit to Rosie Asulin's kind of aesthetic, even though it's from the color scheme and design very different but for me it has the same kind of exaggeration so I liked it I, I, I get also what people didn't like about Chloe I think her, Chloe just has a very classical feminine um, elegance that some people want to keep and it wasn't really what she delivered so I'm really curious what's going to happen here I'm very happy that this position as creative director at least was given to a person who knows the brand very well and is a person that is just female so just to sum this thing up we knew in march during women's day already that of the 37 creative directors in the big houses such as alvia marsh karen richmond pooch uh etc uh five female creative directors were existent uh overall and if we look at the top 50 brands we have like 40 percent women uh we have more women in finance and aerospace than we have in fashion. Aerospace? Are you serious? What are we doing there? Like, girls come down, we need, we need creative director positions. Like, what are we even doing up in space? The beautiful news, because I had a very mean introduction right now. No, I was just like talking about, you know guys, what the situation is right now. And I'm personally just, this, this topic really distracts me from appreciating new male creative directors for the experience for the talent they can bring into a house this distracts me and turns me also into a biased person and this is something i absolutely don't want that's why i wanted to talk with you guys because i also care about your opinion a lot here uh what do you think like is it will it ever change do you think it is changing slowly now that we lost two creative directors we won one it, is it like a ping pong game what is this what's your opinion about that but on a better note, we do have a new creative director at Carbon. You might know Carbon um, from 10 years ago when it was popular, I think. Uh, I remember very much the coats, the strong 60s look. Car Carbon is actually a, old a French haute couture house uh, founded by a woman. And I will not talk too much about the history of this brand right now because you can, it's really everywhere written. And she was an old couture lady who was very smart in marketing as well and founded her brand herself, had a store here in Champs-Élysées and um, was pretty successful with her very feminine and gingham and uh, like a bit cutesy inspired looks. So now we have Louise Trotta back. I think the brand didn't have a creative director for the last four years. And Louise Trotta we know from Lacoste. I pretty much loved her designs she did for Lacoste actually back then. Uh, I think it's one or two years ago that she's uh, out there. Before that she did Joseph. Joseph you might know is a British brand that does very delicate, daily, high quality clothing. I think unfortunately they don't have menswear because it would also have been perfect for men's. Great coats, great cashmere sweaters, everything is wool, silk or cashmere or whatever. and. Um, it's it's not a fashion brand in a classical manner, but, but Joseph is just like it's like the serious form of sophistication without the Phoebe Philo craziness, which is okay. You know, I don't want to be crazy all the time. I'm crazy enough. Like sometimes your clothes shouldn't be crazy if you're yourself very crazy. Then um, you need normal clothes, and Joseph is a really good normal clothes brand.
So uh, she had her debut now in Paris Fashion Week, uh, Louise Trotta, and for Carvin. I'm really genuinely happy that we see Louise Trotta at Carvin. So what do we see in this runway show? To me, when we want to describe the Carvin woman, because that's something I like to do when I look at a show, it's who is the wearer of these clothes. Don't go from yourself. Try to analyze first who's the persona they're trying to depict, they're trying to show here. And then you can maybe guess, like, do I have anything in common with this persona? If I don't have it, it's absolutely normal that I don't feel uh, super torn to this brand. So it's normal, but try to understand who is this woman? To me, the Carvin woman has finally grown up. Gone are the days of rose and green checker gingham. We have glossy long fabrics embodying the wearer's body and embracing it in a new level of sophistication. We have no skin. Shoulders wide, waist tight, skirts long, and shoes are flat. We're glowy, flowy, but protected somehow. This is the strongest impression I got. It's like we are covering our body in fabrics that look very soft. It's something very flowy, watery, like a glossy makeup, you know? It's still makeup, but it's like everything is shining. It's beautiful. And we're protected. We still have coats and blazers that we have around our shoulders. We don't show skin that can make us vulnerable. Um, we're protecting ourselves and still shining in our feminine, beautiful way. So the Louise Trotta's Carvin woman is busy. She has somewhere to go. Uh, she doesn't take the coffee to go in her hand. She's not a woman to hold a coffee in her hand and catch a bus. She just sips the espresso like a shot and goes out of the coffee shop. She cares, but that never affects her outer appearance. You can't tell what she thinks, but we know she did care about her look, the way she styled it, the way she acts. She cared about what she is showing to the people. The rest she keeps for herself, but caring is something good here. Effortlessness does not mean we have a quick decision. It can be well thought out, detailed, structured, weighed up, but only essentials are allowed, no details. Details just distract. We only have some, some bigger earrings that really have the purpose of not like, not like tiny earrings or also earrings you wear and it's just like, I want a little bling. They have a purpose there. So what I feel we see in this collection is everything is meaningful. There's nothing unnecessary for the sake of showing design skills or anything. And the, the jewelry that is being used is very nature inspired. The bags have huge chains that we might see in another collection from another designer on the necks, but she used it on the bags. So it looks a bit like somebody took off chains, threw it in a bag and she's carrying them. It reminded me also a bit of the Mew Mew bags we saw where everything is like clenched together into a handbag. And here we also have this scrunched leather bags the dye of softness and then you have these changes to it that it looks like you could have found it maybe by the ocean side or somewhere like like in, that, in its natural habitat these stones with the softness of the bag it's beautiful how it looks all together and they kind of turn into a symbiosis with the clothing because you do not recognize them immediately because they're so soft it could have been a piece of clothing it can be a piece of anything else it's like a beautiful symbiosis also because of <clears throat> the color families she chooses. Everything goes hand in hand and beautifully together. There are no sharp edges. There are smart design choices, beautiful design choices, but there are no harsh edges anywhere. Like everything is just beautiful to watch. There are still some colors that remind us of the past of the house carbon. The playfulness is now a stylistic feature that is hidden behind the curtains of sophistication. We see still the greens, the green stripes, which are a statement look of Madame, Madame Carmen, who is the founder of Carmen. Um, she still tried to integrate it. It is integrated, but it's in a very translucent way with a skirt coming on top of it in a transparent way so that we still see the lines flowing underneath the skirt, which still helps to hide the body's features. But we still see there is actually a fabric of transparency, which makes it a bit more interesting. It's not that obvious. There is a playfulness here with the transparency of fabrics. 
uh, that she chooses especially for the sh for the skirts. There are not many pants. We have overall a very strong skirt season, which I personally love, even though I'm a pants person, but skirts always look beautiful, elevated. It creates a flow. I just, I just like the looks of skirts. So what she does is, in a beautiful way, play with twists of stripes, greens, long chains, and a wide underbra that allows us to receive hints of Madame Carmen's haute couture that she used to do for her private clients. We also see that she's kind of working with the classical outerwear in, in, in ready-to-wear collection. She uses trench coat-like looks for blouses and shirts. She's kind of cutting off the edges of this strong masculine outerwear piece actually and turns it into a very delicate shirt in champagne-like colors. Um, she uses skirts uh, in wool-like fabric that she slits apart and underneath you have this again nylonish underskirt kind of thing that again gives a little hint of there is a body underneath all of this we have a skirt that is a bit like cut in half but we see this uh, very fragile fabric underneath that is covering the legs which makes it again very interesting uh, i love that she takes these very harsh things like a strong wool skirt, a trench coat, and breaks it apart and turns it into something so strong, feminine, but in a very strong way and not in the maybe classical manner uh, defined, fragile way. It's definitely not vulnerable. You're not vulnerable. It's a very flowing and protected collection that you might feel very, very comfortable in as a woman or whoever wants to wear it. That's why I personally love the collection, the shoes, are something very flat. I think they were mainly used to sh just showcase that it's very comfortable, a very cozy and a, bit, a flowy collection. Heels, you know, the sound of heels is already something harsh. As much as I love heels, it is something disrupting in every step you take on your heels. You kind of shock your body every time because it's, it's not a flowing movement. But if you wear flat shoes, it's a flow and it goes with the collection and the fabrics and everything that we see here. And I think that's amazing. That's beautiful. It is the very first show she does for Carvin. We need to have this in our mind, at, in my opinion, for having a debut at Carvin, which is a very complicated house, in my opinion. Uh, I thought she would use way more uh, techniques uh, that the prior creative directors used, but she did not. And I'm very proud of that. I'm very happy for this. I think, I think she knows definitely how to commercialize it in a perfect way. I know it didn't work that way at Lacoste, but I think the Lacoste customer just didn't get her, which makes sense. So I'm really happy to have Louis Trotta at Carvin. I think we will hear way more about it uh, and that it's very relevant for the fashion world right now. So I'm really happy to see that. Um, that's about it. These are my thoughts about women's in fashion and, and uh, Louis Trotta. Uh, let me know what you think about Louise Trotta, also about her history. I think she's a very interesting persona. <clears throat> and it's funny, I know she has a big fan base, which is interesting because I was not aware of it. I thought nobody knows her, but she is pretty popular, actually. I don't know where that comes from. Uh, let me know what you think. I loved um, to look at the collection. It, it's beautiful and I only wish the best for Carmen. Uh, maybe you'll see me soon in a flowy, glowy, natural beauty um, Carmen look soon. And something I wanted to ask you guys before I turn this lady off. Um, since I'm focusing now on my videos, do you want one video per week or two? I can push myself to create two videos. I just want to know, like, I don't want to oversaturate the market, you know? I might change the, I might change the balance of the market with putting two out there because I have such a big influence, as you might know. Uh, no, but I'm like... If, if there is a demand, I would absolutely do it. I just don't want to talk trash. I just don't want to tra talk for the sake of talking and, and nobody cares. I do care if you care, you know. Uh, yeah, I will continue speaking of my thoughts about stuff going on in fashion. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel if I always forget to say it. Um, my Discord link is downstairs, uh, down in the text thing box. Um, if you like to share like personal style and have like talks with geeks, absolutely come in the Discord chat. It's it's fun. I love it. Okay, bye.